Section 22 of Claimants to Royalty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Claimants to Royalty by John H. Ingram. The False Demetrius of Russia. A.D. 1603 to 1606. Ivan the Terrible of Russia, having murdered his eldest son, left the crown to the next, Fyodor, a prince so feeble in body and mind that the government of the country had to be committed to the care of his brother-in-law, Boris. This bold and unscrupulous man aspired to the throne, but between him and the imbecile who occupied it stood Demetrius, another child of the late monarch. The regent left this boy to the care of his mother, the Dowager Tsarina, under whose charge he attained to the age of ten. One afternoon of May 1591, the child was playing with four other boys in the palace courtyard, his governess, nurse, and another female servant being close by. According to the testimony of these persons, he had a knife in his hand. For a moment he disappeared and the next instant was discovered dying with a large wound in his throat. He died without uttering a word. Suspicion of foul play was at once aroused, and some known emissaries of Boris being discovered in the neighbourhood, they fell victims to the fury of the populace. The regent instituted an inquiry, and the result was a verdict that the boy had died from a wound accidentally inflicted upon himself. The townspeople were either put to death or dispersed for their hasty judgment upon the supposed assassins. The palace was razed to the ground, the flourishing town turned into a desert, and the dowager Tsarina forced into a convent. The slovenly way in which the inquiry had been made, the fact that it had been conducted by creatures of Boris, that the body was never examined, nor the knife compared with the wound, together with the attempted obliteration of all surrounding dwellings, afford very strong evidence that a murder had been done, and by the instigation of the regent, but that Demetrius died, there can scarcely be the shadow of a doubt. After seven years, Theodore died, and Boris succeeded in obtaining the vacant throne. Hated and feared by all classes, the whole country was longing for a change from his tyrannical rule. When a rumour came from the Lithuanian frontier that Demetrius, believed to have been murdered at Uglitch, was still alive and in Poland. Amid the many contradictory reports, one main fact was positively proclaimed. That was, the young prince was alive and preparing to contend for the throne of his ancestors. The story which this aspirant to empire gave to Prince Adam Vishnesvieki of Bahin in Lithuania, in whose employ he was, was that the physician in attendance upon him, Demetrius, having been solicited by Boris to destroy him, consented, but instead of doing so, substituted the body of a serf's child for that of the to-be-slain prince and safely carried off the heir presumptive, and placed him in the charge of a faithful adherent of the royal family. Unfortunately, both the physician and the faithful guardian being dead, the tale had to be received for what it was worth. Nevertheless, the unknown produced a Russian seal bearing the name and arms of the Zarevich, and a valuable jewelled cross. This was in the summer of 1603, when Demetrius of Living would have been about twenty-two, an age apparently corresponding with that of the claimant to his name. Visitors arrived, who quickly recognised their resuscitated prince, warts which the late emperor's son had had on the forehead, and under the right eye, were discovered, whilst one arm being longer than another was a still surer sign. The deportment and acquirements of the young pretender were suited to his birth, not the least of them being his good horsemanship and skill in fencing. The Poles, ready for mischief, 
espoused his cause. George, the Palatine of Sandomir, gave him his daughter in marriage, and the Pope of Rome, upon his secret confession of the Catholic faith, sanctioned his pretensions. Thus encouraged, he invaded Russia with a small force, and, assisted by a variety of conflicting circumstances, including the sudden death of Boris, in the course of a few months found himself the undisputed master of the whole empire. On the 20th of June, 1605, the adventurer entered Moscow in state, amidst the acclamations of believing multitudes. On entering the church of St. Michael, the pseudo Demetrius, according to all accounts, acted his part admirably. Kneeling before the tomb of Ivan, his face suffused with tears, he clasped his hands, and exclaimed, O father, thy orphan reigns, this he owes to thy holy prayers. The audience was convinced, sobbed in unison, and from all sides arose the cry, He is the son of the terrible. But a still more formidable test was to be undergone. The dowager Tsarina forsook the convent in which she had so long been immured to behold the man claiming to be her son. Demetrius went to meet her in regal state, and their first interview took place in a magnificent tent, specially prepared for the interesting ceremony. After they had been left together for a few minutes, they came out and threw themselves into one another's arms, in the full view of the enormous multitude which had assembled. Ivan's widow had recognised her son, and the new monarch was master of the situation. He respectfully conducted the Tsarina to a carriage, walking bareheaded by its side. In the capital he treated her with every attention, visited her daily, and provided her with a competent revenue to maintain her royal dignity. A few moments after the murder of her son at Uglitch, she was on the spot and recognised the body, and yet, after having maintained for fourteen years her belief in his death, she came forward and recognised him in the successful adventurer, at the exact instant that recantation was worth any price. Demetrius now set to work to govern with humanity and justice, both qualities quite unsuited to Russian tastes, who soon grew as tired of their new Tsar as they had been of his predecessors. He appears to have been an able and forbearing man, but he outraged the nobles by pointing out their educational deficiencies, and the Greek priesthood by a careless or irreverent demeanour toward their church. This latter error was his ruin. The treasury being exhausted, he began to cast wistful glances at the swollen revenues of the clergy, who had once determined upon his destruction. On the 29th of May, 1606, death to the heretic ran through the streets of Moscow. The excited mobs, headed by priests and Shusky, a discontented noble, who had previously been pardoned for conspiracy, broke into the palace, hunted their prey from room to room, until, already bleeding from a sabre wound, the unfortunate victim leapt out of a window into the court below, a height of thirty feet. He broke his leg in the fall and fainted. The insurgents speedily found him, dragged him, mid curses and blows into the palace, dressed him in a pastry cook's caftan in mockery, and taunted him as to his birth. The wretched man, collecting his strength, exclaimed, I am your Tsar, the son of Ivan Vasilievich, when his agony was terminated by a shot from an arquebus. His followers were destroyed. His wife barely escaped with life, and every kind of indignity was offered to the Polish ladies in attendance upon her. The body of the murdered man, after lying exposed for some days, was unceremoniously buried without the walls, then disinterred and burnt, the ashes collected, and, to make sure of no further resuscitation, mixed with gunpowder and fired off from a cannon. Shuiski, the leader of the revolution, 
was raised to the throne, but finding the memory of his predecessor still cherished by many, he sought to eradicate the feeling by proving him an impostor. The Dowager Tsarina, ever complacent, gave him a written declaration that the deposed Tsar was not her son. But the nation placed little reliance upon her testimony now. Shuiski then pretended to have discovered the body of young Demetrius in the ruins of Uglitch, and his clerical friends contrived a miracle for the occasion. When the body was brought to Moscow, they recognised the corpse as that of the real prince, and affirmed that by heavenly providence it had been preserved in its then condition, it being found quite uncorrupt, and the glow of life not even faded from the cheek. But this miraculous interposition did not satisfy everybody, and whilst the partisans of the late Tsar were affirming that a body had been substituted for the occasion, the whole country was roused to a state of frenzy by a rumour that the conspirators had murdered, burnt, and fired from the cannon's mouth the wrong man. This time a substituted corpse could not be produced. A civil war broke out, but it was some time before a suitable claimant could be discovered. At last a Lithuanian Jew was selected by the insurgents, who, aided by the Poles, advanced into Russia at the head of a large army. A feasible story was invented to account for the escape of the intended victim of the late massacre, and to confirm the nation in the belief of his identity with their late Tsar, Marina, the widowed Tsarina, publicly acknowledged him as her own Demetrius, lived with him as his consort, and had a child by him. Her father, the Palatine of Sandomir, also recognised him as his son-in-law, and in a short time almost the whole empire declared for him. His reign, however, was short. Deserted by his foreign allies, he was forced to fly, and eventually was assassinated. His consort, Marina, died in prison, and Ivan, one of their children, although only three years old, was publicly hanged, the most ghastly act in the entire tragedy. End of the False Demetrius of Russia. Recording by John Ingram.